Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being patient. Uh, we're still adding folks, but we're going to go ahead and get it started. Um, my name is Lisa Roberts. I'm with the Florida Wildfire Foundation. And if you're not familiar, familiar with us, please uh, check us out at our website, www.flawildfires.org. Um, if you do have a question um, that you don't get answered during this session, please feel free to email us at info at flawildfires.org. Um, if you're unfamiliar with our organization, we protect, connect, and expand native wildfire habitats through education, research, planting, and conservation efforts all throughout the state. And our work is primarily funded by the state wildfire license plate. Uh, and whether you have the old look or the new one, you are helping to uh, finance research, education, and planting projects throughout Florida. Every $15 that's donated uh, with uh, the purchase or renewal of that license plate comes to our organization and we spread it around Florida. So a little housekeeping before we get started. All uh, attendees are, on, are muted with your cameras off and the webinar is being recorded. So it will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash FLA wildflowers. And it will be on our website, flawildflowers.org. Look for it about 24 hours after the presentation ends. Questions can be submitted using the Q&A feature at any point in the presentation. And we'll be uh, making every effort to answer everything. We have quite a large crowd though. Um, so if it's not answered again, you can email us at info at flawildflowers.org. Now, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nash Turley. Nash is the co-founder of Lawn to Wildflowers and a postdoctoral fellow at UCF's biology department. Lawn to Wildflowers is a community science project focused on converting lawns to pollinator-friendly wildflower habitat and engaging the public in collecting data on plant pollinators. Nash and other UCF researchers developed a mobile app that educates users on pollinator natural history and lawn restoration techniques, as well as making it easy to purchase native plants and seeds. Nash, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks for being with us today. Cool. Thank you for the introduction. And I will get this shared like that. Uh, you see in the slides there? Sure. Good. All right. Well, I will get going. Uh, like I said, my name is Nash Turley, and uh, I am one of the co-founders of Lawn to Wildflowers. Um, all, we are on all of the social media, so if you want to find us on all those places, it's Lawn Wildflowers at all the places. And let's see, going forward. Okay, so the goals for today are really to put forth some of the motivating fun factoids and sometimes sad factoids about lawns, wildflowers, and pollinators that you know motivate our project, why we think we need more wildflowers in the world. And then uh, lastly, to give an introduction to what we're doing to try to address some of these issues about uh, wildflowers and pollinators and give you a run through of our mobile app and how that all works. So starting with lawns, well, if we want to be concerned about turf grass and lawns, maybe want to know just how much there is total. So how much turf grass total is there in the US? Now, a big study using aerial imagery and satellite imagery estimated that there is about 63,000 square miles of turf grass in the US. Now, of course, that's just kind of a giant number. What does that mean? Turns out that is about the size of the state of Georgia. Uh, or if you prefer, similar to the size of the state of Wisconsin as well. So it's a pretty massive area. And this is now 16-year-old study. I mean, it could be, could be a fair amount more than that by now. So there's a lot of, a lot of area being devoted to these uh, pretty bland uh, monocultures of non-native grasses. So with all those grasses, how much water is used? Now that same study estimated that about 20 trillion gallons of water are used just on lawns 
every year in the US. And again, that's another giant number. What does that mean? So to compare that to something else, about 30 trillion gallons are used for all other irrigated crops in the country. So all of the food that's made uh, uses 30 trillion gallons and we're using almost as much of that just to irrigate lawns. And that uh, same study also found that a half to three quarters of domestic water use is used for lawns. So when we think about conserving water, the use of excess water on lawns is, is a really big part of that. So there are many other impacts of lawns as well, including habitat loss. So anytime you have something that's a lawn, that's a place that's not a habitat that's useful for most native plants and animals. Water pollution, all the, the runoff from chemical inputs to lawns can really have a big effect on um, freshwater and saltwater uh, waterways leading to algae blooms and all sorts of stuff like that. Fossil fuels, burning fossil fuels of uh, using lawnmowers and weed whackers and all those other things. Uh, many of those engines are very inefficient and uh, release a lot of pollution, uh, not to mention the sound pollution, which is maybe the thing that <laughs> irritates me the most. Then there's just the health impacts of a lot of the chemical inputs into lawns, which I don't seem to have a good understanding of. And then cost, one study or one report estimated $40 billion a year spent on lawn care. If that was $40 billion spent on planting native plants, man, think of all the companies that would cater to selling native plants. That would be great. Uh, and then pesticides, about an estimated 60 million pounds of pesticides are sold to domestic or non-commercial users every year, uh, which is about 6% of all the pesticides used in the US because most of those are used in agriculture. Uh, but still 60 million pounds is a huge amount that uh, much of it probably not necessary. Okay, let's move on to some factoids about wildflowers. I really started using the word factoid a lot lately. I don't know why. <laughs> so a lot of wildflower habitats are really disappearing and have been for a long time. So to take a, a local example, uh, longleaf pine savanna is an ecosystem, very, very variable and diverse ecosystem that is spreads uh, across the Southeastern US. And it's estimated that there is about 900 endemic plant species in longleaf pine savannas, so found in that ecosystem and nowhere else. And largely for that reason, that's why this uh, part of the world is now considered one of uh, the global biodiversity hotspots, um, be largely because of the really, really high uh, endemic plant diversity. But unfortunately, only about 3% of that habitat remains intact. And so overall, that makes it one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. And there's even less than 3% that's old growth, that has old growth trees, that's more like 1%. And so there's also a very similar story for tall grass prairies in the US. So two of the most diverse uh, wildflower rich habitats are also in the US are also two of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. So this is obviously very concerning. And so what does all that loss in wildflowers potentially do to pollinators? So this is a huge survey of studies from around the world. So it's 65 different studies uh, from all over. And it, there are studies where they both measured the diversity of plants and the diversity of pollinators. And uh, you can see there's a very strong positive relationship, more plants, more pollinators. And they estimated that on average, every plant that enters that you add to a community adds one or possibly two or more pollinators. Um, so if anyone's used to thinking about data, this is a correlation and we might want to be a bit skeptical of the causation here because maybe there's just something else causing both of these. So what's nice to have are some experiments that look at the relationship between pollinators and wildflowers. So this is a study done in Michigan. And so it, what, what, it was at blueberry fields, so uh, commercial blueberry fields. And for half of the sites, they planted native prairie 
uh, restored native prairie around the edges of the fields. Those are the orange bars. Um, and for the other half, it was a control where there was no planting. It was just whatever was growing there. And after four years, they, they continued to measure the abundance of pollinators in blueberry fields with wildflowers around them and, and ones without. Um, and for native bees, you can see almost a doubling in the abundance of native bees in these blueberry fields when you have uh, wildflower plantings next to them. And then there is a very similar pattern for hoverflies, another very important pollinator. But then when we look at uh, honeybees, and honeybees are a non-native species that are important to agriculture, but not particularly good for the environment since they're not native, they are not affected by these native wildflowers. So they're kind of getting by with whatever was around. So it shows that adding native wildflowers to the landscapes particularly helps the native pollinators, bees and flies, um, and ideally would make it so we wouldn't need to bring honeybees into these um, blueberry fields. So let's get into some details on pollinators. I think it's, got, it's become a pretty common idea that pollinators are really important. We often think of it in agriculture and other places, but of course they're totally critical in wild systems as well and to wild plants. So how many pollinators are, or how many plants are pollinated at least in part by animals? Turns out that's about 88%. So the vast majority of plants are utilizing animals to some extent to help with their reproduction. Now, many of these plants are not, um, a lot of plants have what's called mixed mating strategies where they can reproduce without pollinators, but they'll use them. So not all of those 80% um, totally require pollinators, but at least they use them to some extent. But of course, many, many plants cannot reproduce at all without pollinators. So another example of the importance of pollinators, this is back to blueberries again. And this was a study that looked at the, the richness or the number of species in a blueberry field, and then a metric of how uh, productive those blueberry plants were. And what they found was a, a pretty strong positive relationship. So the more bee species are around this, these agricultural sites, the more productive those blueberry fields are. And this is a com, this is just one example of many studies that have found a similar thing that it's not just the abundance of bees that are important, it's actually the diversity, how many species are in an area. So it's a great example of um, how biodiversity can be helpful to us, but also that um, the biodiversity of pollinators is really important for maintaining plant diversity as well. So when it comes to thinking about bees as being important, uh, it's interesting to think about how much most people actually know about bees. And this was a really neat survey that looked at um, people, like the general public, what their knowledge about bees. And they asked them how many bees are in North America. And they just threw out a number. What was their guess? So th this graph shows along the bottom are the estimates that they had sort of in bins. And then the, the y-axis is the number of people that, that guessed those different values. So that first big bar, that said that over a thousand people guessed that the number of bee species in North America is between zero and 500. So the vast majority of people think that there's 500 or less species of bees. And then you see there's low numbers of people guessing up in the higher, higher numbers. So the real number of bees in North America is about 5,200. So just in North America, there are 5,200 bee species. Um, so most people are getting that uh, way off. So there's a really lack of general knowledge about basic bee biology. And so in the study, they also asked people if, if people thought bees were important. And all, basically everyone said that bees are critically important, but only about 14% of people were able to guess within a thousand the actual number of bee species. So we have this interesting disconnect between, it's great we're at a point where bees are important, but um, we're still at a point where the general knowledge about bee natural history is, is really low. And then when it comes to bees, bees are really struggling. So 
a, a big survey of, of all the studies that have been done on uh, bee populations over time found that about 52% of bees that have been studied are declining quite rapidly. So are decline, have declined by 40% or more. So many bees have not been studied. Like I said, there's over 5,000 species, only about 1,500 have been studied. But of those that have been studied, over half are in serious decline. And another way of looking at bee decline is to look at the areas where bees are declining. So this was a survey using uh, aggregating lots of bee monitoring data. And so in this graph, the yellow areas are where bees are declining. And they found that just between 2008 and 2013, about a quarter of US land area uh, are seeing bee declines. Um, and I do like to point out that's only just between that short time period. And so we don't, we really don't know how much bees have declined since, you know, 1970 or 1900 or 1800s. So just at, just recently they've declined. They're, they're declining over um, much of the US. And you can see areas um, across the Midwest where there's lot, lots of agriculture, the Central Valley in California, incredibly intensive agriculture, seeing bee declines, and then much of Florida as well. Um, who knows? Not, <laughs> I don't know how that's totally clear why that is. You know, land development and lack of native savanna seems like a likely, likely cause. So thinking of bee declines more broadly, there's, there's a lot of factors, but the biggest one, as with the, the declines of most biodiversity, is loss of habitat. Um, in particular areas that are rich in native plants. Of course, pesticides play a role. And then these other factors like climate change, uh, pathogens, sometimes pathogens spread by non-native honeybees, invasive species like honeybees, invasive plants as well. And then, so all these factors on their own are causing, are um, playing a role in bee declines, but also all of them together interacting with each other. More and more studies are showing that when you combine habitat loss with an invasive species, you get a really bigger problem than the two on their own. So there's this interactive effect of all of these pressures on pollinators. So one, one fact about pollinators I always uh, like to talk about is what percentage of global crop value is dependent upon pollinators? So just how much of you know, the profit from foods are, uh, would be lost if pollinators were lost. So it turns out that is about 10% of all food production uh, value is dependent upon pollinators. You may very likely have heard something more like a third, like one in three bites of food is thanks to a pollinator, um, which is sort of a common catchphrase for a long time. Um, and that was based on an old study that kind of looked at which crops use pollinators at all and then ascribe the whole value of that crop to pollinators. This is a more nuanced study that brought in how much yield the pollinators are contributing to and the value over time and all sorts of things um, and came to about 10%. And one reason is that most of the dominant crops, uh, staple crops like corn and uh, wheat and rice, none of those require pollinators, but it's mostly fruits that require pollinators. So even though it's only 10% of our food, there's still many, many foods that would not be viable without pollinators. So this is a list of pollinators that over 50% of their yield is dependent upon pollinators. So if there were not, were not pollinators, I think it's very unlikely that any of these would be viable crops. This includes peaches, apples, pears, kiwis, cherries, cantaloupe, blackberries, uh, almonds, blueberries, cashews, squash, uh, zucchini or cucumber, plums, avocado, chocolate, mangoes, and watermelon. So basically all of these amazing foods would not exist for large scale consumption without pollinators. Okay, so those are really a lot of the motivating factors that really felt that we wanted to do something about the issues of um, wildflowers and pollinators and to focus lawns, you know, to focus on lawns as a great opportunity to do something uh, that's more sustainable and uh, better to native wildlife. But before we really got into our project, what we wanted to do was 
understand some thoughts and opinions about the general public related to lawns and wildflowers. So what we, we did a large survey, an online survey, um, and we asked people uh, what factors might prevent you from converting a portion of your lawn to wildflowers? Because it seems that it is a maybe a popular idea or a lot of interest in supporting native plants and pollinators, but you can drive around and see lawns covered in plain old grass all the time. So a lot of people aren't doing this and we wanted to know why. So we distributed this survey online. We did target native plant societies um, and I think there's also just a bit of bias in who might click and want to take the survey. So these results are really more people that are really interested in plants and pollinators. So think of it as like people that are likely to uh, create wildfire habitat, um, what factors are preventing them? Uh, if it was really a true sample of the general population, um, maybe the results would be a bit different or maybe even more people would be answering some of the different factors. So yeah, we asked people what might prevent them from uh, creating a wildflower plot. And we picked a lot of different categories after talking to lots of people um, that came in three, three large categories, including personal factors like maintenance costs, maintenance time, uh, recreation, not knowing what to do, things like that, appearances, things to do with nature like uh, weeds or undesirable plants, wildlife, bee stings, and then factors that have to do with other people, opinions of neighbors, homeowners association policies, or threat of fines from local government. So here's the data from our survey. So the bars are representing the percentage of people that selected each of those factors. Um, so they selected those as, as factors that might prevent them from creating a wildflower plot. So up at the very top, you can see that none apply was actually the, the top answer. So sort of highlights that a lot of people were very interested in this. Uh, many people are saying that, you know, no, nothing would stop me, or maybe they've already created a plot. Uh, but then the next two down are both things that are um, personal factors. They're maintenance time and not knowing what to do. And um, I actually find, we actually found this result quite encouraging because outreach organizations like ours, like the Florida Wildflower Foundation, I think these are two things that they have the most ability to do something about. They can inform people about you know, what time is necessary or maybe it might even take less work than mowing your lawn every week. And then you can uh, have resources and materials to teach people how to create those plots. I think these are two obstacles that are relatively easy to overcome. A few other factors I, I described as being very persistent and these were uh, factors related to other people. So opinions of neighbors, uh, HOA policies and local government infractions. Um, I call these persistent because these results stayed very similar, whether people were interested in pollinators and whether they had already created a plot, things like that. So it seemed like there was always about 10% of people that were concerned about these things. And so it is something important to keep in mind. And I'm always open to if anyone has ideas how organizations can help sort of overcome some of these issues. Maybe, maybe this is... Um, uh, campaigns to uh, show that most people like this stuff or working with local governments or HOA policy, HOA um, boards to uh, change, change the ideas about native plants. Oh, and I wanted to point out one other thing. Um, the wildlife things tended to be really low. So stings and um, uh, undesirable wildlife were really very few people mentioned those. Although undesirable plants was pretty high on the list and that makes really good sense because actually weeds in native wildflower plantings are one of the biggest uh, barriers to overcome, struggles to deal with. Uh, so I think that shows a, an informed audience that knows that dealing with weeds is always going to be a struggle and will just take work and preparation to try to minimize uh, the risk of just getting a, a plot full of weeds. So when we founded Lawn to Wildflowers, we had a number of goals including inspiring people throughout the country to convert uh, grass lawns to native wildflowers and trying to make that as easy as possible, to teach people about native pollinators, uh, about their natural history, and uh, try to provide resources to help learn how to identify native pollinators. And then 
um, following that to attempt to enlist the general public to collect data on pollinators so that we can gain an even better understanding of uh, where they're uh, struggling, where they're declining, maybe where they're improving. So our main um, avenue to address these uh, goals or try to achieve these goals is through a mobile app that we developed. Uh, the app is called Lawn to Wildflowers. It's available on, all, on um, Google Play and the Apple app stores now. Uh, we are about to release a new version uh, that'll have some updates, uh, but there is a version up now. Um, and the app includes a guide to just learn basic information about pollinators. It includes an interactive game to learn how to identify pollinator groups, a guide to finding native wildflowers. So if you're at a nursery, it can give you some good suggestions on what plants to buy, uh, and also some links to buying wildfire seeds if you'd prefer to uh, use seeds, and then some step-by-step -step methods for creating wildflower plots. So the first thing in the app is these plot methods. And we sort of surveyed a lot of the suggested uh, methods for preparing sites to convert turf grass to, to wildflowers. And there's many, many approaches. And so we, we picked three that we thought would be accessible to most people that would be hopefully successful in all parts of the country and don't require pesticides or buying plastic or other machinery and stuff. So. Um, this is just straight up preparing the site by digging out the sod, by smothering um, the sod with cardboard, and then uh, planting or seeding, or sheet mulching, which is similar, so smothering with cardboard and mulch and then leaving it there and planting through it. Um, then I think ideally over time you're not going to keep mulching, but I think that's up to you whether how you want it to look. Mulch isn't always great for pollinators. But instead of kind of going through the step-by-step -step of how to do these, I created a video to show the smothering with cardboard method because that's one of my favorites. Um, so I'm just going to play that now. Um, but oh yeah, just before I get to that, this is a screenshot here of the mobile app where you can click on each of these things and it gives step-by-step -step sort of uh, methods for going through uh, those three different site preparation methods. All right, so I'm gonna play this video. Hopefully you can all hear it. Someone will let me know if they can't. This is the Lawn to Wildflowers Guide to converting a patch of turf grass to native wildflowers by smothering with cardboard and transplanting potted plants. The first step is to gather up some cardboard. Cardboard dumpsters behind businesses such as dollar stores are a good place to look. Try to get only uncolored cardboard. Select an area of your lawn you want to convert to wildflowers and mow it. Cut the grass very close to the ground. And then water the ground thoroughly. Put down cardboard to smother the grass. Overlap the pieces to prevent gaps and put down at least three layers. And then weigh down the cardboard with bricks, rocks, or mulch. Let sit for at least two months. Now after just a couple weeks, the grass here is struggling, but it's not dead yet. Give it some more time. Once your wait is over, it's time to get some native plants. If you're lucky, you can find a nursery like this one that focuses on native plants. When picking plant species, keep three things in mind. Make sure the species are native to your area. Get a variety of species that vary in shape, color, and flowering time. And pick species that are appropriate for your soil and sunlight conditions. After two or more months, remove the cardboard. The grass should be dead by this point. Then water the plot thoroughly.
arrange the potted plants about one foot apart from each other. Add water to the hole before transplanting your plant. Pack in the soil so there are no gaps. Air pockets cause plants to dry out. Once everything is planted, water them again. Keep your new plants well watered for a few weeks. And then sit back and watch your pollinator garden grow. We hope this guide was helpful. Please check out our website at lawntowildflowers.org and you can download the free Lawn to Wildflowers app at the Apple App Store and on Google Play. Cool. Well, that was kind of our laying out every every fine detail on on one approach to creating a wildflower plot. Of course, there's many different ways you could do it. I think maybe the only thing we left out was just, um, especially if you're planting on bare ground like that, you'll you probably want to do some weeding um, to, for a while to make sure your plants you planted in are getting the best advantage they can. So one of the resources on our app to try to help that whole process is a guide to native wildflowers. So in the app, we uh, have a map here that shows various regions around the country and you can select your region and then it'll pull up a list of native wildflowers um, for that region. This was um, a lot of help from the Xerxes Society, the Society for Insect Conservation. They had put together these pollinator friendly wildflower plant lists that we adapted to, to go into the app. Um, and for each plant you find, uh, you can click on it and there's information about flowering time, height, and things like that. So we hope that if you're ever at a nursery or something overwhelmed by what plants to choose, this can be sort of a short list of uh, you know good options for, for your region. So the app also includes a pollinator guide and one of our goals was just to build some awareness of basic pollinator groups. So it's, you know, it's, it's fairly crude as far as biology goes, but it's a, it's a start. So we selected eight different groups, honeybees, that's one species. It's the only one that's one species, bumblebees, there's many bumblebee species. And then we have all other bees. So as we know now, that's thousands of species. Uh, but as long as you know, it's not a bumblebee or a honeybee. And then we have wasp, which again, hundreds of thousands of species of wasp in the world and flies, beetles, butterflies and moths, and then any other uh, visitor of a flower. In the guide for each of these groups, uh, you can click on it and it'll give you some example photos and some natural history facts, and then some written uh, pointers on how to uh, recognize and identify those groups. So the next step is to actually engage uh, to teach people how to identify these groups. So we developed an interactive game that uh, has a bunch of different levels and each of those levels quizzes your ability to recognize these different pollinator groups. So this first um, level is butterflies versus wasp. So you're shown a photo of a butterfly or wasp and uh, asked which one it is. And then this first image here, you can see this, this level is honeybee versus bumblebee. So this is the second level. So uh, it'll show you a photo and then you just have to say, well, is that a honeybee or bumblebee? In this case, honeybee. And while you're doing this, you can always click on ID tips and that'll pull up a list of uh, specific pointers for telling apart honeybees versus bumblebees in this case. Then there's another form of the game uh, that's like a CAPTCHA, uh, those little games you've played uh, to prove you're not a robot. Um, and so it'll show you, so in this case, it's testing your ability to, um, distinguish wasp from butterflies and moths. So it's saying, select all the butterflies. So you can click on all the butterflies and hit, uh, hit done. And it'll give you immediately immediate feedback if you've gotten it right. So I want to show a couple examples of how that works. So this level 
what is the level of fly versus honeybee. So it's asking you select all the flies. So uh, maybe you could play along with me. Which ones do you think are flies? That one and that one. So if you select that one and that one, you are correct. These are both flies. Those are both surfed flies that are actually mimics of bees. So it can be a little tricky. And then it'll say, yeah, you got it right. So this is the same level. This is fly versus honeybee again, but it's saying select all the honeybees. So what do you think? Which ones, which of these are honeybees? If you selected these three, you're right. Those three are all honeybees. And this is another bee mimicking surfed fly. And, and then it'll say you're right there. It does get a little bit trickier later in the later levels. So this is wasp versus all of the other types of bees. And so uh, it's asking which of these are bees uh, versus which one is a wasp. So which of these do you think is a type of bee? versus uh, as opposed to being a wasp. So it's a little trickier. These, these three are all bees. This is a leaf cutter bee. This is a, a type of metallic green sweat bee. And this is like a paper wasp. Uh, so some of them, some bees are very wasp looking, so it can get kind of tricky. And for all of these, you can click and it'll give you tips on how to tell apart those two different groups. Um, and once you go through the full game, once you get through eight levels, it unlocks a new feature of the app, which is the ability to collect data on pollinators. And the data you can collect are, of course, the same groups that you're tested in the game. So once you get to this point, we hope that we're confident that you can be very good at telling apart, you know, be, you know, any, any other bee from a, a, a bumblebee or a wasp from a fly, things like that. So you can go out and hit start, and wherever you are. Uh, it'll record your location, and you can count however many pollinators you see. Once you hit stop, it'll ask you a few questions like, what type of habitat are you in? How far did you walk? Uh, various other things. How many wildflowers did you see? Stuff like that, uh, which are you know common types of things that pollination biologists would want to know. So we hope that if we get people all around the country to uh, record data on pollinators, we can have a better sense of what areas are, are um, struggling or um, what types of factors uh, promote healthy pollinator populations, things like that. So that's kind of our summary of our project that uh, we're really focusing on turf grass lawns as you know, a really great opportunity to do something better for plants and pollinators. And uh, one of the best things we can do is just replace that turf grass with native wildflowers and in hopes that that'll really also help native pollinators. And you know, if, if this became the new norm, maybe we can really start to reverse some of the troubling declines we're seeing in pollinators. That's all I got. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you uh, want to check out the app, go to the app stores and look for, uh, just type in Lawn to Wildflowers, or you can go to our website, lawntowildflowers.org. You can find everything there. Um, we have a mailing list that you can sign up for there or follow us on all the social media. Uh, that's it, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nat, uh, Nash. Um, we're gonna bring Stacy on now to, we've got quite a few questions, so she's gonna be fielding those questions. Again, if we don't Excellent. get to your question, um, please feel free to email us at info at flawildflowers.org and we will um, send them to Nash and have him answer. Great, thanks, um, Nash. We've got a lot of lot of questions here, and I, I'm just going to try to clump some of these together. Um, we, we have a lot of questions on site prep. Um, you obviously showed us this sheet mulching um, process. What are your thoughts on solarization? Is that something that you would recommend? I tried that a little bit. I shied away from that as a recommendation at a nationwide level because it's very finicky. Um, if you're in the shade or it rains a bunch or you don't really put it in well, I found it didn't work. But if you're in full sun, it's going to be you know a hot month or so, and you really uh, uh, dig that plastic into the ground so it's a tight seal, uh, I think it can be a very effective method. Um, but for just trying to do a general thing that I thought would be effective to nationwide or the world, I shied away from it. But if, if you're into it and you have full sun, then I, I think it's a good option. Um, if cardboard is not available, can you use like a heavy layer of newspaper for sheet mulching? 
Yeah, I think newspaper will will it'll probably break down a bit quickly, but I challenge anyone, you know, cardboard's always available. <laughs> you know, I just went behind a dollar store. You can you can find it. Um, so I I think it's always available. And about the what size plot can you uh, be effective with sheet mulching? Um, for somebody who's got a large yeah. area, uh, like a thousand square foot, one person right. was asking about what method works for that. Yeah, I, cardboard can be done, but you're gathering a lot of card. Like it, it, you need a lot. And so even a small six by six foot plot, like I loaded up the whole back of my car to do that. So I, it's probably unfeasible at larger scales. Um, so I, I also was kind of targeting uh, sort of smaller approaches uh, just because I think that's what more people will be able to do. If you're doing larger scale, then I would probably look more towards maybe maybe rototilling or large scale. Uh, I mean, I, 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 herbicide is a common approach. I don't always like recommending it, but a lot of large scale restorations do use herbicide and it can be effective. Um, so I think uh, those are good options. If you really wanna dive into the options, the Xerxes Society has a really great PDF called Organic Site Preparation and has really lays out all of these options. And a lot of them are sort of catered towards larger scales. Um, so that's a really good one to look at if you're looking for larger, larger scale options. Great. Um, do, so there's some questions about the impact on ground nesting bees and other burrowing animals. If you are doing um, site prep, like um, with sheep mulching or even solarization, can you talk mm -hmm. about that? Um, yeah, I think it's maybe worth keeping in mind, but I, I don't have any, you know, evidence or data about it. It's just kind of speculation. I think in the long term, if you're really looking to promote habitat for nesting bees, you're going to probably want to try to have some bare ground um, and leave, you know, plant stems and things like that. You know, thick mulch and really thick ground cover may not be great for promoting that. Um, but, you know, whether whether there would be nesting bees in a patch of turf grass I don't, I don't know, probably not, unless there's like some bare ground. Um, other than that, I, I don't really have a lot of insight on that. Um, do you work with or recommend working with seeds? You, you shared live plant material in your um, yeah. demonstration, but what about seeds? Yeah, I think seeds, you know, the outcome from seeding is, is more variable. You're, you're a bit more, it's harder to weed because you got to tell what you, you can't really tell easily what is the plant you want versus a weed. And, you know, your, your seeds that you put down don't have much of a head start over the, the seeds that are just already in the soil. Um, solarization supposedly can help kill some of those seeds. Um, so if you really want to do seeds and you're in a good place to solarize, that might be a good option. Um, but we, I also created a video, um, that's on our YouTube page, or you can find it on our website that is showing options for seeding. Um, you know, it, it had kind of the expected outcome. It did, a lot of the plants came up right away, but then they were competing with a lot of the non-native stuff that came in or also, you know, a bunch of Bidens came up as well, which, you know, I think is good for a pollinator plot. Great pollinator plant. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you never know what you're going to get, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're rolling the dice a little bit more. Um, but if you're willing to, you know, have it be a bit more wild and willing to kind of gamble a bit, that's a great option. It's a lot cheaper um, and you can pick and choose the seeds you want. Uh, but yeah, you basically want to get bare ground. Um, well, a common approach is to get bare ground and get those seeds on there, compact them down and water it and just uh, see what comes up. Great, thanks. Um... Okay, um, what about, uh, people are asking questions about the impact of honeybees or they're just curious about honeybees. Where do they come from and how do they affect our native bee population? Yeah, so honeybees are, uh, the, the research now suggests that honeybees are probably originally were in both Africa and Asia. Um, and they've been interacting and cultivated by humans for thousands of years. So humans have been moving them around for a long time. But then, of course, they were brought here to the New World and all you know all around the world, and so they are very important for agriculture. You know, many crops are you know, very dependent upon them. You definitely would not have almonds without honeybees. Honeybees from all around the country are shipped to the Central Valley for the almond um, bloom. So it's a very resource-intensive practice to have honeybees out there. And from a sustainability, it would be much better if we could have our crops 
being pollinated by native bees and native bees are much better at pollinating, frankly, than honeybees. So ideally we would have more wildflowers and get our pollination services from native bees, but that's not really where we're at because of all the habitat loss and all those things. So they're kind of a necessary evil right now, but in places with lots of honeybees, which is a lot of places, there's more and more evidence that those honeybees are competing for resources with native bees. So they can decrease the abundance and diversity of native bees. They often preferentially pollinate invasive species of plants. And so they sometimes spread invasive plants. They can spread diseases to native pollinators. Now the studies that have looked at this have very variable results from kind of neutral to negative. So, you know, I think it's just good to have the viewpoint that honeybees are not the focus of conservation. Saving honeybees is like saving chickens, domesticated chickens. Like they're important, but they're not a focus of conservation because they're a semi-domesticated non-native species. Um, so it's really better to work on actions that benefit native bees because they're the ones that are really struggling and need our help. Great, we have a lot of questions about talking to HRAs and neighbors. I know you, you touched on that a little bit in your presentation, but um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, maybe some things that can be used to help um, not just neighbors, but HRAs, county commissioners, municipalities, um, just greater level of um, community, educating them about the importance of this or, or how we can get them to um, start looking at um, maybe not not the disparaging parts of turf, but why we want to do this in our landscape. Yeah, yeah I have a couple of thoughts about that um, from some other talks I've seen that have really grappled with these issues. Um, and one of them is that when it comes to HOAs and uh, what I've heard is that really the issue is more your neighbors most of the time and not like the board of the HOA or whatever. You know, there's that's probably not always true, but it's really like when neighbors complain about it, that's when it sometimes becomes a problem. So it's really kind of a community effort. If you can talk to your neighbors or do things that your neighbors don't see as problematic, then you're all good. Um, so really think of it as a community effort is, is one way. And so then what can we do to try to prevent neighbors from being concerned? And a lot of the advice I've seen and other feedback is that, you know, we've got to try to approach planting native plants with so that it looks like there was intention put into it. If you're just kind of leaving something and just throwing out a bunch of seeds in a big area that looks wild, I mean, that sounds great to me, but I think that's a lot more likely to have people think it looks trashy or whatever. So if you can you know, make a bed or a boundary, you know, design it out, landscape it, so that it looks like it was done on purpose, I think that can go a very long way to not raising any red flags for anyone because most people aren't going to know if it's a non-native plant or native plant it's just plants as long as it looks like it was put there on purpose so i think clustering plants together landscaping it making plots that are fenced off or have a boundary or a sign that says this is a native wildflower garden i think all of these are things that can prevent having neighbors having bad um, responses to those um, so those are some thoughts Okay. Um, are there, if you're, if you're looking to do this in a school garden, are there plants to avoid, um, native plants specifically to avoid that shouldn't be used in the presence of children? Oh, well, that, uh, <laughs> I mean, probably, I mean, there's, there are plants that are, that are, um, potentially cause irritation and that are poisonous and stuff. I think, um, it's hard to give a, a general answer to that just because now we're dealing with all diversity of plants. Um, I mean, I think if you, the, all the foundation people would probably have a more couple that might come to mind than, than, than I would. So if you have any specific plants in Florida to avoid, um, that would, if you guys could say that'd be good. Yeah. I mostly would just keep away from plants that have spines or thorns. I don't know of any, um, wildflowers that are particularly toxic um some that have seeds that are toxic yeah um but mostly it's the ones that are thorny that maybe you just don't want them touching yeah so maybe like mimosa fine or something some of those can have some thorny bits and um yeah if you're going to buy plants it's pretty you can just feel it see if see if a kid's gonna <laughs> hurt himself and i or hurt themselves and 
um, yeah, probably just safe to just encourage people not to, I mean, I love crushing up and smelling plants. I don't normally taste them. So, um, but you know, just it's good to always be safe and not taste or eat plants. You don't have 100% positive what they are. Can you um, talk a little bit about maintaining the wildflower pot once you've, once you've gotten it in your landscape? That's really, that really is the tricky one. And I'll definitely uh, be guilty of trying to create some plots using some of these methods and it kind of COVID started and it just didn't really keep up on them. And they're, I don't know, they didn't really turn out so well. So it's always a bit of a crapshoot, but a couple other plots we did make, actually one of the, the plot that's in the video um, we weeded it well, the plants were really nice and healthy and we would put them in and just keeping on it, you know, weeding, just keeping on it, it, it's, it's easier if you do it frequently because it's easier to tell the plants you planted versus the weeds, if you don't let them get too big. Um, so just really focus on the first few months. I think then that's the most critical time. And then after that, I think it's kind of up to personal preference, how, you know, how much you want it only to be those plants or let it be a bit more wild. So weeding is one toolkit uh, thing to always have as a tool. Uh, beyond that, you know, it's an option to put down mulch between your plants. Um, that could help, it, you know, if you, it's another way of, if you want it to look nicer, you know, there's a trade-off there. It's a bit less wild. It may not be so great for native bees and stuff, but you know, you got to do what, what works for you. So if you put in big potted plants and you want to mulch between them, I personally think that's a reasonable option, um, especially if you want to try to keep it looking uh, nicer and not uh, discourage neighbors and things like that. So, um, and then I think being careful of water, especially in Florida, when it gets in the summer, you know, get a, a bunch of hot days and it doesn't rain, you want to just be careful, uh, making sure things get really well established and, and watered for you know, maybe maybe even the first year, keep a good eye on them. Um, beyond that, we'd hope you wouldn't have to water them, but you know, you never know depending on your soil or what plants you chose. So uh, being aware of that, um, you know, plants really drying out, they could die. And so I think that's the main thoughts I have. Okay, I'm just gonna do a couple more questions. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about why mulch is not good for pollinators or what kind of mulch might be okay to use for pollinators? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert in this and, um, but in general, you know, most native bees nest in the ground. That's most native bees are solitary bees and most of them nest in the ground. And especially here in the Southeast, the most common favorite type of ground for a bee is like sandy bare ground. So if you're covering that up with a bunch of leaf litter, a bunch of mulch, they can have a hard time getting through it. You know, bees are incredibly diverse. So some will probably like the, you know, thick ground cover, but um, the most diversity of bees and sweat bees and stuff are probably gonna like having more bare ground. Um, so that's that's my basic understanding of why mulch might be a little bit problematic. Um, but, you know, everything's a trade-off. Um, and, you know, a small plot, you may not expect a ton of bees to nest in a small plot anyways. So other parts of your yard might be better to focus on leaving some dead stems or dead logs or dead trees or bare ground um, just to try to promote nesting habitats for bees. And I have a couple of questions about the app. Um, you have a lot of fans about who have used the app and like it, so that's ah, good cool. to see. Um, someone asked if you are considering adding or if you could add soil type to the app, pointing out that there are very different um, yeah. soil types. You mean, yeah, for the, the, the wildflower and seed guide, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be great. I think that very quickly gets into very fine scale details. It's just beyond our ability to do at a nationwide level. Um, because, you know, so in terms of catering to a nationwide audience, we kind of had to just be like, these are plants that are reasonable for your broad region. And so if you want more focused information, um, you really need to uh, look at the resources that Florida Wildflower Foundation has put out. Um, Native Plant Society has good resources. There's a, there's a lot of options for getting that more fine detail. And I think unfortunately, just because we're catering to a nationwide audience, we just don't have the ability to get into those fine details, but it's definitely important. And um, you wanna pick plants that are good. You know, If you're ever really dry site, you wanna pick plants that are good for dry sites and 
same for wet sites. So it's, it's a very important factor that's just uh, a bit difficult to <laughs> provide resources for. Um, uh, but those resources exist if you look for them. And does the app address light needs for plants as well? Yeah, well, when you click on the species list, it'll just say whether it's like a high, uh, high full sun or shade plant. So there's a little bit of information there. Um, but, you know, that might be, you know, if you're at a nursery or something, that's a, always an easy question to ask. And often they'll just say on the plant whether it's full sun. If you're getting started, I would just default to picking a full sun site if you can. I think when it comes to a pollinator plot and wildflower plot, that's your best bet. Um, but you know, if, if you only got shady sites, you do want to try to pick plants that are good for shady spots. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, I just want to say there are a lot of questions about what plants to use for different parts of the state. Um, I think that's a little too specific to get into, but uh, we do have a lot of resources on our website as well, flawildflowers.org. Um, a lot of different handouts that tell you exactly what um, what zone, hardiness zone um, plants are good for, as well as what light and soil conditions. So please check out our website as well um, if you're just looking for resources on um, you know what plants to add to your landscape. Um, and with that, thank you, Nash, and I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Thank yeah. you, Nash. Thank you. Stacey for fielding all the questions. We still have quite a few questions that are unanswered. So again, if you'd like to get an answer to your question, email us at info at flawildflowers.org and we will do our best to get them over to Nash. But thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will um, have a presentation next month. We'll be letting you know on Facebook and through our newsletter what that will be on. And we thank you for joining today.